Um, as we wait here for a minute, I'll, I'll begin the message this morning just with a review of last week. Last week, we talked about open door opportunities from God and how God provides us with opportunities not only in relationship with him, but also in relationship with one another. And so I believe that God wants us to be watching and praying so that his Holy Spirit can make us sensitive to those opportunities. I don't know about you, but I know there's times for me where God gave me an opportunity and I missed it. And I passed it by. Because I felt like I was too busy or maybe I felt like something else was more important. God is giving his church today open door opportunities and he wants us to take him up on that. When we find those opportunities, God wants us to be stepping through the door or across the threshold in obedience. There's no substitute for obedience, okay? Even as we talk about faith today, we're going to talk about how obedience plays into that faith. And then finally, once we've stepped to the, through the door and we get on the other side, God doesn't want us to just be faithful for a season. He wants us to endure patiently, right? Has God ever given you something where you didn't have to just say yes to him for the moment, but you had to say yes for the moment and for the next day and the next week and the next month and maybe the next year and you kept saying yes? That's worship to God, amen, when we endure patiently. God has been showing me on the other side of those doors of opportunity, there are revelations that he wants to give to us. And he won't give them to us on this side. It's not like he's going to say, well, here, let me show you what I want to show you. He says, I want you to first trust me. I want you to step through this door of obedience, and then I'm going to show you something, maybe something that you weren't even asking for, you didn't expect. God has the answers before you have the questions. That's good, right? That's, the, that's not even in my notes. That's a freebie. And so God will, God will supply us with what he knows that we need even before we know that we need it. Praise you, Lord. I want to begin with Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 today. Hebrews eleven six, 6. And it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. How many of you want to please God? Amen. I want to please God. Think about 2 Corinthians 6, 9, where it says, so we make it our goal to please him. He says, if you don't have faith, You can't please me. Without faith, it's impossible to please me because anyone who comes to me must believe that I exist and that I reward those who earnestly seek me. Amen? The opportunity to earnestly seek God is a door that is opened by faith. You are obviously not going to seek God if you don't believe that he exists. You will also not seek God if you don't believe that when you seek him that he will either respond to you or reward you, and yet this is what his word says is true, and this is what we must stand on, okay? Not some other feelings, not some other book, not something else that somebody else says. It says right here, he is, I am, the rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. Amen? If you're going to seek God, you must have faith to do it and then believe that he's going to respond. Otherwise, you might seek God for a season, for a little while, okay? And when that answer doesn't come or when that, you know, whatever you're looking for doesn't happen, you might start seeking something else. Maybe you're in that place today where there was a time in your life and a season in your life where you were seeking God with everything that you were, but for whatever reason, maybe it's disappointment or heartache or trouble or trial, you started to turn to something else. God says, you'll seek me and you'll find me when you seek me with all of your heart. So don't be divided, okay? Those who earnestly seek him will be rewarded by him. Now, Hebrews 11, one says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see, okay? Faith is not something that you 
conceive of in a, in a physical sense. It's not something that you see with your physical eyes. Faith, it's almost like faith begins to create, but I want to say this of faith. Faith is more than a mindset. Faith does not just involve your mind. If we think, if I could just alter what I believe up here, then I'd be able to operate in faith. Faith involves the mind, but faith is also soulful. And faith, it involves all of us. Faith involves our hearts. Faith is heartfelt. Faith is when, faith is when you, at your core, begin to rely fully on God. Okay? That's the kind of faith that opens doors. That's the kind of faith that takes us through. That's the kind of faith that earnestly seeks God and promises and, and receives. He is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. Therefore, faith involves knowing and trusting and leaning and depending fully on the Lord. That's not just something that we come to in, a, in an instant or in a moment. It's something that we need to pattern our lives after, seeking, seeking him, learning how to rely on him. You know, sometimes when I feel like I've taken another step in faith, it's almost like I real, or feel like I've taken two steps back in some other area. It's like, okay, I'm, you're, you're teaching me to rely on you here. Can I just, would you help me just to rely on you for everything all the time? That's the faith journey. Hebrews 11 goes on to talk about Several individuals, and we won't mention all of them, who were examples of faith, and God gave them open door opportunities, and they crossed over to the other side through their demonstrated acts of obedience through their faith. For example, Noah was a man of faith. Why was he a man of faith? Who built the ark? Noah, Noah, right? Remember that one from Sunday school? It's kind of catchy, right? And so Noah built the ark that was the evidence of his faith. He didn't just say, well, that's a good idea. Well, that's going to be really hard. How are all the animals going to get in the ark? Who's going to shut the door? Right. No, he didn't do that. He said, I will build. And he responded with faith. Abraham, okay? God says, Abraham, Abram, I want you to go to a land that you do not know. But we kind of have a good thing going here. My family's already well taken care of. He says, no, I'm calling you to a land that you do not know. I'm going to make your, your descendants more numerous than the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore, but you have to follow me. Well, where are we going? Well, I'm not going to tell you that part, but I want you to step out in faith. Let's go. And by faith, he went. Sarah, it says, by faith, she believed that she would conceive. Now, we know Sarah's faith wasn't perfect. Sarah, Sarah didn't get to that point at the beginning because there was one time that God said, you're going to have a child, Okay. And, and she's, she laughed about it. <laughs> Let me name him Isaac. That means laughter. I laughed about it at one time, but God brought her to a place where she considered the one who made the promise to be faithful. Faith is a journey, right? Are you on a journey today? God wants to grow your faith because without faith, it's impossible to please him. He wants to grow your faith so that you can believe and earnestly seek him that he might encounter you and reward you hallelujah i want to say of god that our god is a creative god amen he is a creative god we see his creativity reflected and all you have to do is look at the sky have you been looking at the sunsets in the evening recently just how beautiful and vivid the colors are and how none of them are ever the same it may be similar but they are unique in their expression this is just an example of the creativity of god or look at look at the majesty of the mountains that he's made wow okay or look at just even like the uh complexity of like living things when you just take the time to think about things and how they work and and uh, man, when I was in school, I never enjoyed science. I think it was just, I'm more math brained than I, I didn't want to know all that stuff. And now when I think about the complexity of creation, it's intriguing to me. Recently, I heard that the average human brain has 86 million neurons, okay? 86, I mean, you know, some of, them, some of you might have 84, but some of you probably have 96 too, right? So we've got these 86 million neurons. Now, scientists say that it's the grouping 
of these neurons inside of our brains that makes it possible for us to be creative. Did you know that? You've got, you've got neurons grouping right now. Don't let them, not, get, get, get rid of the ones in the group that say, man, I hope he gets done with this message soon. Start to regroup those. No, those just group on their own, right? And that speaks to God's amazing creativity. God gave man and woman the ability to be imaginative and to be creative. And that ability comes from God himself. Whether it's demonstrated in a, a piece of art or a song or a poem or a sculpture or a structure or a strategy. Does that make sense? Our creative God gave us the ability to create. Okay, So we, that makes sense. We understand that. But here's the thing. Do we understand that our faith, the faith that he gives us, has the opportunity to create open doors. So there will be some doors that God opens and he wants us to step through by faith. There will also be other doors that God allows us to open simply because we believe. Amen? And we have the ability to trust him. I, I, get, I get joy when everything is like not my idea, right? I, don't, I, I, I can't do it. I don't want everything to be my idea. So when somebody else comes up with an idea and they take steps and their obedience ends up producing something, I'm like, whoa, that's awesome. Amen? How do you think God feels when he sees us made in his image and we take these steps of creativity and we make a decision by faith to do something. Woo! God says, that's my son. That's my daughter. Amen? God wants us to understand. I want you to understand. I want you to begin believing for something. Because if you don't believe for anything, you're not going to get anything. And I feel like sometimes we get so satisfied Living in the culture that we, and we don't, we just don't, we don't really have a whole lot of wants or a whole lot of needs until something affects our comfortability. That's not a life of faith. A life of faith creates, a life of faith believes that there is something more. Amen? And I believe that God wants his church to begin to believe him for something more and that our faith will create not only opportunities for us, but also opportunities for other people. Amen? And God will stand back and say, look at my kids go. Amen? Hallelujah. This morning, I want you to turn with me in your Bible to the Gospel of Mark. We'll be looking at Mark chapter 24. And while you're turning there, let me say this about faith. Faith begins by casting a vision for something. Okay? So we walk by faith not by sight. I'm not talking about a vision out here. I'm talking a vision, about a vision up here of what could be. Faith begins by casting a vision. But then faith also counts the cost, right? You know how the Bible says in Luke 14, Jesus said, consider the cost before building a tower. You come up with some creative idea and you say, okay, I'm gonna, I think I can do this, but what's it going to cost? Maybe it's going to cost time, it's going to cost money, it's going to cost resources, it's going to cost sweat, it's going to cost energy, it might cost some heartache. What's it going to cost? And then faith takes steps in action, okay? And by doing so, faith begins to create an open door. Let me give you some background to the story today. We're going to talk about the woman with the issue of blood. This story begins in Capernaum near the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus is there, and he's teaching, and a crowd has gathered. And, and I don't know how big this crowd was, but probably pretty big. Jesus is starting to, his, his notoriety is preceding him. People are expecting him to have come back across the sea. They're waiting for, them, for him, and so he starts teaching. And in the middle of his teaching, in the middle of his message, there's a man a worker in the synagogue whose name is Jairus, and Jairus comes to him in distress. 
Now, I can only imagine he, he's in great distress because, you know, it, it would be awkward. Today, if somebody just popped up and like, Pastor, I need your help, I'd be like, okay, fine. Can we wait until the service is over? Because I'm kind of here in the middle of a message, right? But that doesn't deter Jairus. He's like, he's in distress. He's like, Master, I need you. And he interrupts Jesus' teaching. And the focus, which was on Jesus and his teaching, now shifts to Jairus' daughter, who's a 12-year-old girl. And she, what she, whatever she's dealing with, she is this close to death. And he is desperate. And his desperation takes him to Jesus. His desperation causes him to interrupt, okay? And so the, the focus shifts from Jesus and his teaching to, to Jairus' daughter, and Jesus says, let me go with you, and so they begin to go together. Well, what does the audience do? Right? They, they said, well, he's not teaching. We, we, let's go f- watch this. What's about to happen? We've heard about Jesus healing people. What's about to happen? Let's go see this. And so the, the crowd starts going. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen like, you know, you come across something and you see somebody, but then you see a crowd of people following. It's like, let's go check this out, right? And so probably not only the people who are there listening, but maybe even more people along the way. And so there is what I envision as this massive crowd that is following Jesus and people are jockeying for position and they're wanting to get as close to Jesus because if you're on the outskirts, you may not see what happens. And so there's this, it's probably bumping and and shoving and maybe even some pushing is probably like being at a concert, which is why I don't like going to those. And so you, they're all going together. All right. So now let's pick up in Mark chapter five, verse 24 says, so Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, hallelujah, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering." As we think about this woman with the issue of blood, I want to analyze her problem for a moment. We know from Scripture at face value that she had dealt with this issue for at least 12 years. We know that she had seen doctors. The Bible says she had seen many doctors, and yet her problem only got worse. We know that Scripture says she spent everything that she had, all of her resources, okay, Now she was broke, and she was still suffering from her issue. Was her issue worse now than it had been before? Well, if I was dealing with her issue, I would probably say yes. Okay? Anyone here this morning have an issue? I'm not talking about an issue of blood. Maybe another type of issue. It could be a serious health need. Or it could be a different type of overwhelming issue or just some type of ongoing need that hasn't been met. It could be emotional, could be financial, could even be relational, where you've struggled year after year after year after year and your heart is at a place of being broken. Let me ask you this morning, I wonder if your struggle was like this woman's. I wonder if your struggle was meant to teach you how to step out in faith because the Lord himself wants to be the one to meet your need. 
Have you ever been struggling with an issue and you get frustrated and you're just like, if this person would just do this, if the doctor would just get me my medicine, okay? Or if this person would just do this, if this person would just admit that they're wrong, that would solve the whole problem. I, I'm convinced in my faith walk with Jesus that there are times that he says, you need to stop focusing on other people and their responses because in this situation, I, Andy, want to be the one to meet your need. And as I meet your need, it's going to draw you closer to me. God is teaching me that over and over and over again. I want to give you three points this morning about faith that opens doors. That is the title of this message, faith that opens doors. Point number one, faith gets you to Jesus. Faith gets you to Jesus. Remember, without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Your faith is meant to get you to Jesus. Her faith got this woman to Jesus. Now, in order for her to get there, and I I really appreciate the worship team and their sensitivity to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Uh, You don't know this, but Heidi and I know this. Most of the time, we never even talk about what songs they're going to do, and yet time after time, it's like the Holy Spirit just goes whoop, 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 right? And he's doing that again this morning when she was, she was helping us get to that place of worship by saying, is there something getting in the way? Is there something that you need to give to God? Because in this woman's case, there were a lot of things that could have kept her from getting to Jesus, and she had to push past her embarrassment. Uh, you know, it, it, having an issue like that would be embarrassing in our day and age and in our society, but back then it was even more embarrassing because to have that kind of issue would have, would have been to deem you as unclean. And according to Leviticus 15, she was unclean. Everything that she touched was unclean. She wasn't even supposed to be around anybody, and certainly not a crowd. She could have been punished by the law for exposing other people to her illness during her uncleanness. This is why she couldn't come to Jesus openly. That's why she couldn't come like Jairus came and said, Jesus, I need your help. My daughter's about to die. Why didn't she just do that? She couldn't, right? Right? And you might feel like there's something going on in your life that you're just so embarrassed of and so ashamed of that you can't bring it to Jesus. I want you to know you can and he will not reject you, but you can't entertain that thing and fully approach him. You got to push past that. You got to say, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of being addicted to this. I'm tired of being a slave to this, whether it's even a slave of an element or, or, or of embarrassment. I am tired. I need Jesus. Amen. This woman had to push past the rules of how things work. She wasn't even supposed to be there. This woman had to push past the expectation of others. Others would have said, no, this is not your place, just like they, like, they tried to say uh, you know, when people were bringing their little children to Jesus to bless them, and the, and, and the disciples got frustrated with them and said, no, no, get away, and Jesus said, no, the little, bring the little children to me so that I can bless them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Amen. Other people would have said, nope, this is not your place, this is not your time, this is not that. And she had to push past that. Let me ask you this morning, are you living on the outskirts? Are you living on the outskirts because you're letting something keep you from getting to Jesus? Is that really where you want to be? Faith would say there's something better with Jesus. Faith would say let's push past sin and dependence on things of the world. Let's push past doubt and fear and anxiety and other people's expectations. Let's push past unforgiveness or anything else that's getting between you and Jesus. Faith gets you to Jesus. And that means you gotta push past that other stuff, okay? Or ask Jesus to help you with it. But don't entertain it. Don't let it be an excuse. Right? Don't stay on the outskirts in a pity party because your healing's not there. Your healing's with Jesus. Point number two. I like this. Faith captures the Lord's full attention. Faith captures 
the Lord's full attention. I love how Jesus stops and says, who touched me? And his disciples are like, are you, have you lost your mind? I know we're getting used to you saying things that we don't understand, and we don't understand this. The answer is everybody, everybody's touching you right now, right? And they're dumbfounded. Let's do a little word study. The word touch comes from the Greek root word hapto, which means to fasten or to cling to. When Jesus asked, who touched me? He was not referring to the act of somebody putting their hand on him. In fact, she didn't even touch him. She just touched his clothing, right? But that's not what he was talking about. He was saying, who touched me? What Jesus was really asking is he was saying, who clung to me with their whole being and unwavering faith? Who got a hold of me? Many people in the crowd that day put their hands on Jesus, but this bleeding woman was the only one who touched him with her faith. And Jesus wants the same with us. He wants us to, just like that word says, he wants us to cling to him with unwaver unwavering faith. Do you hear me? Isn't that what Jacob did when he wrestled with God? And he says, I will not let you go until you bless me. There's faith there. Amen? I'm going to take hold of you, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang on, come what, come what may, and I'm going to believe that you have something good for me. Jesus wants us to cling to him with unwavering faith. And when you do, God will never be too busy multitasking that he won't give you his full attention. If we have 86 billion neurons grouping together, I want you to know that God has mm, Googleplex. His Google's better, right? It's infinity, amen? And he will give you his full, oh, that the God of the universe would give us his full attention, hallelujah. I love how Jesus listened intently to the woman as she told her story. How long did that take? I don't know, right? But she, the Bible says, she tells him everything. Now, if it was me, I'd be like, Okay, I was like, we're, we're in the middle. I was preaching, and now we've got, we got Jairus' daughter. She's almost dead. And I'd be looking at my sundial and be like, okay, can we, can we speed this up a little bit here? This little girl's on the brink of death. It's, it's, listen, it's not in that moment that Jesus cared less about that 12-year-old girl. It's in that moment that woman needed him, and he was fully present. Oh, God, that you would teach me to be fully present. When I'm not fully present with him, I'm not operating in the spirit. Jesus was operating in the spirit. Okay? And he, held, he holds time in his hands. And when you're being led by the spirit, the spirit will make time for all things. Right? Jesus did not hurry her along. He was fully present. Let me ask you this morning, are you fully present for Jesus? Are you giving him your full attention? He deserves that. He's the God of the universe, right? Give him your full attention. And when you do, when you give him your full attention, this is so cool about our God. I just love this story. The Lord is not expecting your faith or my faith to be perfect. He's not expecting your faith to be perfect. The woman with the issue of blood, she did not have perfect faith. Her faith was mingled with superstition. And the superstition was, if I could just touch the hem of his garments. <clears throat> can, is that in the Bible anywhere? No. All right? So she got that wrong. Have you ever gotten something wrong? And then felt like you got it wrong, and so, nope, eh, thanks for playing. That disqualifies you from God and all his love and things that he wants to do for you. That's not the case. She got that wrong, but what she got right was that her faith got her to Jesus. Amen? Is your, faith getting, is your faith giving your undivided attention to Jesus? Because if you'll do that, that's what he's looking for, and he is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. He said to her, it's through your faith that you received your healing. He said, in stating this explicitly, he was saying, your, Jesus said to her, your faith has healed you. 
He wanted her to know, it's not my clothes that healed you. I don't have power in these tassels, right, that you touched. Your faith has healed you. And in this, God demonstrates his nature. He demonstrates that even when our faith is not perfect, he is still God. And he will still move on our behalf if we will seek him. You don't have to be perfect in your faith to access the power of God, but you do need to have a deep and abiding faith that goes after Jesus with undivided attention. As you think about your life, is that, is that something that you're bringing to the Lord? Do you bring to him undivided attention, or do we just get so used to being preoccupied with all kinds of things that we can't even sit down to spend time with the maker of the universe? He deserves that, and he rewards that. Amen? Mm -hmm. Point number three. Faith creates a testimony that glorifies God. Faith creates, I was talking about our obedience creating opportunity or our obedience to step through the opportunities that God gives us, but our faith can also create opportunities that will glorify God. This encounter with Jesus changed this woman's life. Jesus said to her, daughter. Okay, why'd he call her daughter? I think he was wanting to heal more than just her disease. I think he was wanting to heal her image. Maybe because of what she suffered. Maybe she didn't feel like she was anybody's daughter. Maybe, it, I mean, it obviously, what she was dealing with, if she was considered by the law as unclean, it would have affected her whole life. Not only the struggle, not only the pain, not only the embarrassment, but also the relationships. Maybe she had been disowned by her family. I'm speculating. I don't know. All that I know is that it had an impact on her. And Jesus, whenever he says something or does something, it's always with purpose. It's not by accident that he said daughter. I think he wanted to communicate to her not only her healing, but also her identity. He says, you are a daughter. Who is he talking about? Daughter of God. Amen. You're a daughter. Daughter, and it's and it's cool because I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but so for a moment, Jesus' full focus was on a 12-year-old daughter, Jairus's. And in an instant, faith accessed Jesus and power went out from him, right? Now, it makes me wonder, we know that that power, that power was from the Holy Spirit. He was baptized and anointed in the Jordan, and he, and he received the Holy Spirit, and he walked in the power of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus told his disciples that they would receive power, he said it'll be because the Holy Spirit comes on you, so wait for that power. It makes me wonder that when Jesus, like when he laid his hands on people, was Jesus familiar with this feeling of power? Power that would come out of him. Maybe he was, and he recognized that the power of God had moved out of him. Does that make sense? My focus was on this 12-year-old little girl that needs, she's almost dead, right? And now I need to shift, but I'm now in this moment because of faith. I wasn't expecting to put my, it almost seems like Jesus wasn't expecting it. Do you read it that way too? He says, but your faith has opened a door, and now my full attention is going to be on another 12-year-old, a 12-year-old daughter, a daughter that's been suffering for 12 years. I want you to know, doesn't just because your age, you can be 12 years old, you could be 72 years old, it doesn't make any difference. You could be a son or a daughter of God, amen? And your faith, when you put your faith in God, God is just so limitless that you don't have to file your plea to God in the order, I gotta wait for another you know, 700,000 people because their need is more important. No, by faith you immediately access the power of God. And he is ready for you and available for you to do that. If we will seek him and we'll seek him and find him, we'll seek him with everything. When do we do that? Lord, teach us how to do that. So that all of us rely on you. So that, and, and what will happen is in your testimony, got to get back to your notes, Andy. Faith creates a testimony that glorifies God. Not only will the testimony of your healing glorify God, but the testimony of your identity. Jesus says, you're my daughter. Your faith, not my tassels, healed you. Now let that healing be applied to every other area of your life. He want, do you know that? God wants to touch and heal every area of your life. 
He wants his peace and his power to invade every area of your life. Hallelujah. That's beautiful. Jesus said, daughter. Jesus said, your faith has created an open door for your healing. Jesus said, go in peace and may that peace be established in every area of your life. I'm wondering today how that message hits you. How does that message hit you? Because again, I believe God is, God is pleased when we are believing him for something. And if we're just so satisfied that we don't really need to believe him or depend on him for anything, that's not pleasing to him. But coming to him with all that we are, pushing past the things that would hold us back, pushing past the desires of this world. We live in this world. We're not supposed to be of this world. We're not, we're not supposed to love the things of this world, right? And sometimes it's pushing past all of that stuff to say, God, I'm, not, I'm tired of depending on all that stuff. I'm sick of living on the outskirts of faith. I want to press into you. I want to know you because I believe that when I do that, you're going to reward me. You're going to touch me. You're going to heal me. You're going to give me an opportunity. And my faith, you want my faith to open doors not only for me, but for other people. Imagine how this testimony affected the people who witnessed that that day. Imagine how this testimony affected the people that she was in relationship with. Imagine how it affected the people she didn't have relationship with, and yet they heard about what God did for her. Oh, I'm getting excited. I'm getting excited about what God wants to do for you. So you can say, this is my testimony. I touched Jesus. He touched me. Amen? And that testimony touches somebody else. Maybe it's somebody else who's dealing with your problem, but it doesn't have to be. You don't have to have an issue with blood today to recognize you have an issue that God wants you to bring to him, and he wants to touch and meet and testify and identify and transform and change because he loves you. And your faith doesn't have to be perfect, but it does need to get to him. Amen? It does need to get to him. Are we getting to him? Let's close our eyes, bow our heads. God wants you to trust him. He wants you to trust him. He wants you to trust him with everything, with all of it. All of it. He wants you to trust him with the struggle. He wants you to trust him with that relationship. He wants you to trust him with the thing that you've been butting your head up against for 12 years or more. He says, you trust me because your trust will get you to me. Move past the sin. Move past the, the distractions. Move past the other things. Get to me. I will reward you. Your faith doesn't have to be perfect, but we got to be together on this. Will you come to me? Don't let anything hold you back. Let me create through your faith a testimony that will change and impact all of your relationships, not, not just the ones you have now, but the ones to come. Let my story be your testimony. What are you trusting God for today? Holy Spirit, would you help us right now to identify what you, what you want us to begin trusting you for? Trust him, trust him, trust him. Now, if you trust him, don't just let that be a thought. Let that trust be something that requires you to seek him out. And begin to seek him and seek him and seek him. And seek him. Holy Spirit, would you help us today to identify those things that you're wanting us to push past so that we can get to you. So, Lord, you, our lives can be transformed by your word and, our, and your presence and your power. We want to be testimonies of you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Father, I pray your blessing over your people this morning as we soak in your word and the possibilities of what you want our faith to do with you. Lord, help us to be conduits of your power. In Jesus' name, amen.
If you need prayer this morning, I'd invite you to come up, even if you're processing through things and you want prayer for that today. We'd love to pray with you this morning. God bless you. Seek him in Jesus' name. Amen.